Lady Charmaine, and my guest today is one of the top voice actors in the entertainment industry. Lending his talent as a voice actor in categories of animation, television series, feature films, and voice matching. He also served as a voice double for a string of A-list actors over the last decade. And he's here today to talk about the documentary of the late Roger Ebert, Life Itself. Help me welcome Mr. Stephen Stanton to the show. Hey, Stephen, and welcome. Hi, how are you? It's great to be here. Well, Thanks I'm, for having me on. I'm glad to have you on. It's always good. I was listening to some of your um, impressions, and I'm telling you, you got that Morgan Freeman down. You are really good. <laughs> well, thanks very much. You know, that's uh, quite a lot of work goes into those uh, voice matches uh, when, the, when they need that out here in Hollywood. How long does it take you to prepare if you're going to be uh, learning someone's voice? How long does it take for you to prepare so you can match them exactly? It really depends um, on, you know, the actor, what they're trying to do. And one of the things that plays into it is how much time they have uh, for me to uh, to prepare. And sometimes there's not a lot of time, but most of the... Most often they'll uh, give me uh, reference material, sound files. Sometimes it's a few days in advance. Sometimes it's a few weeks in advance. And I'll have time to rehearse and practice. And then many times when we get to the, uh, when we get to the studio, the sound stage, in the case of a feature film, many times they'll actually have me watch part of the movie so that I get an idea of what the actor was doing in that particular film so that I'm not just doing, you know, a one-note impression, but rather, um, uh, you know, a... Uh, an informed performance. And then sometimes when you're in a rush, I'll have 10 to 15 minutes to try to knock something out really quick. Okay. Now you are now doing the biggest voice role yet, and you have taken on the distinctive voice of the beloved film critic, Roger Ebert in the documentary life itself. Tell us about the documentary of the late Roger Ebert. Well, life itself is a combination of not only, uh, uh, the memoirs that Roger wrote, the book Life Itself, but also, you know, Roger's life at the time uh, that the film was being made. So it's a combination of things. It's a look at the past and a look at the present. And uh, it combines the two together very well. It takes a look at his life, you know, in the past as a, as a film critic, you know, uh, for, uh, for the newspaper and also on television. And then it goes into the present where uh, we talk about, um, you know, his uh, dealing with his illness, um, you know, his family life, his wife, Chaz. And uh, so it's a very all-around, it, it really is about life itself, Roger's life. And speaking of his wife, Chaz, you were handpicked by Roger's wife. How does that make you feel to know that she had so much confidence in you to play the voice of her husband? Well, it's, uh, it's very much an honor. It's very gratifying that she trusted me uh, to speak her husband's words that... Uh, especially in the case of, you know, the memoirs had never been spoken by Roger out loud. All we know is what he wrote. And uh, so part of part of the job uh, of this particular film for myself and the director, Steve James, was to interpret what had been written and try to figure out exactly what were Roger's thoughts behind it and how he might have talked about it if he were talking to you one on one. Now, there's a lot of buzz around this documentary. I'm talking about award buzz. How does that make you feel? Well, again, that's, that also is, uh, it's really gratifying to know that, uh, what we did worked because, um, it was a big risk to do something like this, to take someone who is very well known, not only to the public, but to his friends and to his family in particular, and to have someone emulate his voice. We were all kind of, I think everyone was worried on both sides, over in my camp, and then of course on Steve James and Chaz's side, they were worried, would people accept this, or would it pull people out of the picture and distract them? Fortunately, it seems like it's working really well, and people kind of accept it. And Steve James has told me on more than one occasion that uh, one of the most popular questions he gets asked after the film is over is how he got Roger to record all that dialogue. And, of course, then he reveals to them that it wasn't recorded by Roger, that he actually got together with me and we recorded it together. Because listening to it, it really does sound like Roger. If no one ever said that there was a voice actor behind it, you would really believe that he recorded his own memoirs for us to be able to have after his passing. Because you hit the nail on the head. Now, I grew up watching, of course, as so many other people did. And then to hear you sound like him, it's amazing. Well, thank you. Thank you. That means I'm, if, if people don't realize it's me, then it's a, a job well done. <laughs> Now, I know you probably get this question all the time. Now, are you an impressionist? Not 
not in the true sense of the word, like someone who goes up on stage and does, has an act, you know, where they do impressions. My my field is very specific, and it's uh, what they call it out here is either voice match or voice doubling. Sometimes you'll hear a sound alike. But what happens is that I'm usually called in on a, let's say, a feature film. It's it's finished. It's in post production where they're editing it and fixing all the sound. And let's say they have a uh, some dialogue that you know was filmed out on the street and a truck drove by and you can't hear it. So ordinarily, what you would do is call the actor that did that dialogue back into the studio and they would do what's called looping, which is uh, dialogue replacement, mm-hmm. and they would loop that line and replace it. But many times, what happens is that post production is done so many months after principal photography that the actor that you need now is off on another part of the world doing another film. They just simply physically cannot be there to do the work. And that's where they call in someone like me, where they say, we have this actor, we need these lines uh, re-recorded, or we have new dialogue that we want to do. And maybe, you know, over the shoulder where you can't see that person's mouth, they want to have you say a, a new piece of dialogue that helps explain the scene better. And uh, they'll give me sound reference files for that actor and for that particular film, and, and I study those. And then I go into the to the sound stage, and with the director, I help to find the emotion and find the the, the point of view that that actor might have had if, if if he were there, actually doing the scene instead of me. So there's a lot of thought that goes behind it. It's not just doing an impression, you know, for like a sketch comedy where you're just doing it for the sake of humor. If I do my job right, no one will ever know that that wasn't that actor uh, recording that dialogue. That is really good. You know, that's good to know. And I'm noticing some other films, they didn't have a voice actor match the voice um, as exact as you do. Well, you can tell that somebody else just did that voiceover, that they interjected it. Sometimes that happens, and a lot of times, believe it or not, sometimes it really is the uh, the same actor, but what happens is they're, it's being recorded under such different circumstances uh, that sometimes they're not able to, to match what they call the ambiance of the original scene. Mm. So it sounds like they're in a studio or someplace else, and it just doesn't match, even if it really is the actor. And sometimes, you know, some amount of time has passed, and maybe the actor has a sore throat that day or some other thing that just makes them sound different, so... It's kind of a gamble. It doesn't always work the way, you know, the producer and director would like. But if they play their cards right and you have a good engineer and everything, uh, most of the time it goes undetected. Okay. Now, as a voice actor, how is your work different from an on-camera actor? Well, one of the things that uh, voice acting, one of the biggest challenges of voice acting is not being able to use your physical presence, your body, your facial expressions. They might help you uh, say a line uh, a certain way, like if you're angry, you might, you you know, you're behind the microphone, but you might shake your fist or raise your eyebrows or grit your teeth, and that will make your voice sound different. But you can't, like an on-camera actor does, they they might just look at the camera, or they might look at another actor in the scene and raise an eyebrow or give an expression, and you know what they're thinking. Voice actors don't have that luxury. You have to get that across just with your voice only. You don't have the same, it's a different set of tools than when you're doing on-camera work. Okay. And so you prepared and you did a Roger Ebert's documentary. Were there any special considerations you had to make in creating the memoir voice? Yeah, there was a few things. The first thing that I did just on my own was I read Roger's book cover to cover so that uh, I, since the movie, of course, can't, it does not have every page of the book represented in there. It was only going to be selections. I wanted to make sure I was really had a fully rounded view of what Roger was writing about chapter by chapter. The second thing that Chaz and Steve James wanted to do was they didn't want Roger's voice to sound necessarily the way you heard him on sneak previews, which is or at the movies, which is his professional voice, his on camera voice. They wanted him to sound more like it would he would sound if he was sitting in the room talking to you about movies one on one. And the way they did that was they had very, uh, they had selected very specific sound files, reference files that they wanted me to use to practice his voice with and not just go by, you know, footage from him on television. That is so interesting. I mean, I would love to have been in the studio as you are doing his voice. Do you like put a picture of him up so you can kind of imagine him speaking? How do you get yourself in that mindset? No, I, I don't have a picture of him up, but the mindset is very important. And what I 
what I do is, because one, one of the advantages of being a voiceover actor is you don't have to worry about hitting your marks and addressing this, you know, the scenery, the set. And, uh, so what I try to do is when I'm reading the lines, um, I see, I try to picture Roger in my mind, uh, saying the lines. And I do that with every actor that I'm doing a voice match for. I try to picture that person, use what they call the theater of the mind and create the scene in my head. So I'm seeing it as I'm reading it off the page and imagining their body movements or them saying it, that really helps me get to the place that I need to be so that it comes off well. Now, my last question, were you nervous to take on the memoir voice of Roger Ebert, a voice that's so well-known by so many people? Oh, my God, nervous is an understatement. (laughs) I I was literally sweating bullets, shaking in my boots. You can think of any sort of cliche you want to about that. But, yeah, it was so important to me to get it right for a number of reasons, not only because... You know, I was uh, very much, you know, a fan of Roger or Roger and respected his work. You know, this was going to be something that Chaz and her family and very close friends of Roger were going to hear, and I certainly didn't want to disappoint them more than anyone else. Um, so, yeah, Steve James and I were both, both very much aware of the importance of dialing this in just, you know, just the right way so that it wouldn't offend anybody or make people think that I was making fun of Roger or anything like that. I wanted to come off as a serious piece of acting, just like you would if you were in a film. Well, good to know. Well, I want to make sure that everyone go and check out the documentary Life Itself in theaters now. Do you want to leave us with any parting words? What can they expect from this documentary when they go to see it? This documentary is really, it's a roller co- an emotional roller coaster. You'll laugh, you know, you'll cry, you'll do everything in between. It's a great uh, behind-the-scenes look at both Roger's career and, uh, and Chaz and his family and his love for his family and his wife and for film itself and for life itself. It, there's really so much packed into this documentary. It goes beyond just being a a strict documentary film where you're talk, looking at a, a subject and it could be, you know, historical or something. This really is about a person's life and uh, what they were all about. You're going to see sides of Roger that you haven't seen before. This is really, a, as Chad said, a warts and all portrayal of Roger. He decided not to hold anything back. So you'll hear about his struggles with alcohol and, and everything else. So uh, it's, it's great. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, my pleasure. It was uh, wonderful talking with you. Nice talking to you, too. And I look forward to having you back. All right. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.